America is rapidly becoming a post-Christian nation. If this trend continues, what will become of us? Are we relics of faith that no longer fit in the new America? Given the many flavors of social, religious, and political disagreement, it is reasonable to ask how minority views have quickly advanced into majority policies. For example, homosexuality was once considered immoral by nearly all citizens of America. Even homosexuals hid their conduct because it was understood to be aberrant behavior that brought shame to the individuals and disgust to society. People knew the Bible called such behavior an abomination. It was also obvious that homosexuality was abnormal when compared to the natural order of life and procreation. That was why it brought humiliation when homosexual behavior was discovered. In fact, sodomy was often illegal. Nevertheless, we all realize that homosexuality has morphed into a cause to bring change to social, religious, and legislative policies. Some, well, they work for the day when an openly homosexual president will be elected. If that day comes, what becomes of our nation's foundation built on biblical morality? Homosexual activists are no longer satisfied coming out of the closet. Some want to lock vocal heterosexuals in the closet where disparate views can be silenced. And some view the biblical language prohibiting homosexuality as hate speech. How did the moral sea change accelerate to the current damning degree? Perhaps the turning point could be identified by taking a look back to recall despicable early hate crimes against homosexuals from the last century. Some burly straight guys assaulted someone believed to be homosexual. Most sane people agree that nobody should harm, torment, or kill a homosexual person in modern society. That is excluding in Islamic nations where homosexuals are harmed, tormented, or killed according to Muslim law. Now, even though the Bible suggests some sexual sins are best managed through horribly harsh punishments, our culture rejects such treatment of fornicators, adulterers, or homosexuals, etc. Homosexuals should be protected, just like all law-abiding citizens. We all deserve protection under the law. Homosexuality happened to be a minority problem, and even calling it a problem can now be considered inappropriate by some moderns. The vocal homosexual minority successfully advanced their minority views into becoming a policy issue to be embraced by a segment of the majority. In other words, straight people have taken on the cause of gay people. And who would argue with the premise that it is wrong to torture or kill a homosexual? The idea is abhorrent and barbaric. Such general agreement became a stepping stone for the minority to secure additional protections for their minority class. Each step on the path toward erasing inequality moved the minority closer to their goal of full equality. Sadly, not even Hollywood can convert a biblical abomination into a righteous cause. Homosexuality may be celebrated on screen, on stage, in art, and even in Congress, but God still condemns it. For clarity, I believe in equality before the law. I believe in tolerance. I believe people have the right to live as homosexuals. I believe homosexuals have the right to reject the Bible. I'm not intolerant. I, I simply reject the rhetoric of some homosexual activists who would demand that I support their behavior or call it normal. It must be abnormal because that's the way the Bible deems it, an abomination. It's not normal. Of course, not everyone believes the Bible, so it is absurd to assume those who do not should be expected to follow the standards declared in a book they reject. However, it is also absurd that those who do reject the Bible should presume that the rest of us should abandon 
our biblical beliefs simply because it makes them uncomfortable. Comfort is not an inalienable right or an expectation guaranteed by our Constitution. Do the right things and you might find it. Do the wrong things and it will likely elude you. If a homosexual insists on being comfortable in a sinful habit, their comfort is best protected by not asking a Bible believer if it's okay to flaunt a sinful practice. If you want to remain comfortable, quit sinning. Or don't ask a person who believes the Bible for their opinion about sin. Homosexuals do not require our approval. Why should they demand our acceptance? Why can't we just agree to disagree about such things and be nice to each other in spite of our differences? Homosexuality has found its pathway to becoming mainstream. Supporters of homosexuality have successfully advocated for social, religious, and legislative policy changes advancing the cause of homosexuality across our nation and within numerous so-called Christian denominations. What was previously labeled simply as gay became a modern alliance known as LGBT. Soon, other sexual minorities opposed to biblical norms teamed up to advance the cause of additional aberrations. As of this time, the abbreviated label has expanded to LGBTQQ1PS2AA. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. It was necessary to include smaller and smaller subsets of confused sexual oddities. If the perversions continue to expand, the abbreviations may soon require billboards instead of bumper stickers to support each new group seeking synergistic support for their behavior. Privately, do some of their leaders wonder which sexual deviants cross the line and must be voted off the label? Is any perversion considered sinful or disgusting? We're often asked to accommodate those who reject biblical norms. Accommodation should not lead to a fundamental acceptance of that which is morally unacceptable. Tolerance should not require a surrender of our biblical values. If tolerant desires to accommodate are confused with our requirement to remain distinct, we risk being swallowed through assimilation. Christians and Jews must remain vigilant to never assimilate and become lost to the distinctive call to live as God's chosen. There is a highly activist element among the anti-biblical minority who attempt to incapacitate those who support and promote biblical norms because it makes them feel uncomfortable. Christians should not make sinners uncomfortable. Eventually, sin will make a sinner more uncomfortable than we are capable. When a sinner finally regrets his or her sin, we should invite them to encounter our Messiah. We should invite the Spirit of God to address the sin problem. We should expect God to convict, to convince, and to connect the sinner to the Savior. 